Hello and welcome. This is uh, Tom Cooper and I'm really glad to be uh, with you for this session. I'm excited to be able to share some of these ideas. The title of today's presentation is The Four Levels of Thinking as a Geek Leader and it's subtitled What Nobody Tells You About Achievement. Um, now I just want to take a moment to um, have you uh, consider whether you're in the right spot. And I just want to say that if you, you are in the right place for this session, if you have ever been frustrated because you have bosses who made really bad decisions, you know, how, how could that be? How could they possibly make decisions like that? Uh, you're also in the right place if you've ever felt like there are people who are around you who just don't get it. Just, they just don't get it. They don't understand. And also, you are in the right place if you have ever been in a situation where you have seen people get promoted who really didn't deserve to get promoted. It doesn't make any sense. How did that person get to that position? If you've ever felt that way, you are in the right place. And so uh, I just wanted to uh, reassure you, if you have been thinking about these kinds of ideas, why you would join us, what's, uh, what's important to you to think about from a, a leadership perspective or as a, as a technology person or somebody who's more technical in your thinking and approach. And if I were in your shoes, I'd want to know who, who is this guy who is, uh, who's talking to me today? Who, who is this person? And um, my name is Tom Cooper, and I help teams communicate delegate, manage conflict, and plan. And uh, if I were in your shoes, I'd want to know, you know well, what, what qualifications does this person have to even talk about these types of topics? How is this relevant to me? I mean, is this kind of frou-frou, soft skills, hooey, or is there something really useful in, in what this person has to say? Well, let me tell you, my story goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a young software and IT geek. And every day, he worked on technology projects. And he worked on technology projects that involved these kinds of technologies. And uh, he likes to say he's buzzword compliant. And, and what he found was that these technology projects often did not work out right. And it was baffling because we had good technology and good business problems and smart people, and yet the projects didn't work. And he, he tried to figure out what it was that was leading to success. And and he thought, well, maybe, maybe project management would be helpful. And so he went and studied and got certified as a project manager. And he found that that was useful. But let me ask you, have you ever been in a position where you've been working on a project that's run by a project manager that didn't work out? My goodness, if I could see your hands, they'd all be up, right? Because, because just having those tools and techniques doesn't mean that your project is going to be successful. There must be something else. And so he began to, to dig in deeper. What possibly could it be until... One day, he stumbled into an idea, quite by accident, that he could learn how to influence other people. And not only that, but that influencing other people was a set of skills that he could acquire just like all these other technical skills. And so as he began to, to understand that and dig into that, he read books and he, uh, he tried to apply the ideas that he was learning uh, with his, his team. Uh, they were his guinea pigs in his laboratory experiment. And what he discovered was that as he applied some of these ideas, his team got healthier. There was less gossip and less backbiting and less throwing people under the bus. And the technology projects that he worked on, they got healthier too. And the project delivery got better and stronger and faster. And the relationships with internal customers got better and better. And, he, and this is amazing. And he thought, how come nobody ever told me this stuff? Until finally, he said, I'm going to do that. And so for the last eight years, that's what I've been doing. I have been working with leaders and teams to help them understand that leadership and influence are skills that you can acquire. They're more long-lasting than technical skills, and they are super valuable. Uh, and here's the thing. If you look at that list of buzzwords, you can see that all of those technologies, well, almost all of them, are completely worthless in today's market. Those things that I spent so much time and energy acquiring – they passed very quickly. Into the, these, these are like dinosaur age technologies now. So uh, the new, good news is that learning people skills, influence skills, is really valuable, and it will last a lot longer than the technical knowledge. But as we jump into this today, I want to ask you a question. And this is a, an unusual question to ask, and it's a little bit esoteric. And I'll just ask you to bear with me a little bit as we work our way through this. What if what you know 
is wrong? What if what you know is wrong? If you're, you're sure you're right about something, but you're wrong, would you want to know? Now, look, I know, especially as someone who's done a fair amount of quantitative work in my life, I never want to be wrong. And so my gut reaction to that question is, yes, I'd want to know. But here's the thing that I want to bring up before you jump to, yes, I'd want to know. What are the implications of that? If what you know is wrong, it means you have to change. And many of us would rather die than change. And I'm, I'm going to bring up a quote that I think is a, a relevant quote. As I said, it's a little bit esoteric, but I think it's valuable. Uh, Krasinski says, the map is not the territory. The only usefulness of a map depends on similarity of structure between the empirical world and the map. The map is not the territory. The only usefulness of a map depends on similarity of structure between the empirical world and the map. Now, what I'm getting at here is that your map is only as good as its truthfulness to the territory it's claiming to map. And if what you know about how things work turns out to be wrong, you're going to run into difficulty. And I'll give you a specific example of, of how this is, applies in real life. How many of you have ever bought a GPS many, many years ago? I've got one of these sitting on my, in my garage shelf. Why? Because it's not usefulness anymore because there's no longer similarity of structure between the map and the empirical world because roads change. Things change. The world changes. And so if what we know is wrong and we're not prepared to change, we're going to run into difficulty when the roads around us change. Now, as we're jumping in today, I want to ask you to be very practical. How are you going to act after we leave today? I want you to think as we're going through this content today, what's something you can apply, an idea you can use? What's something you can change? I was doing it this way. Now I'm going to try and do it that way. Or finally, what's something you can teach? Now, I want to be super clear about this. I'm not suggesting that you should get onto a webinar and try and teach, but maybe it's something you can share with your spouse or your coworker. Maybe it's something you can share with your boss. I could entertain you for an hour here, but that would not be ultimately valuable. My goal is to equip you to do something useful and powerful with these ideas when we're done today. So as we're going through, maybe you're taking some notes, maybe you can write down something you can apply, something you can change, something you can teach. And when we get to the, the end of the session, I want you to be able to, to be able to bring those to mind, to be able to say, this is what I'm going to do with this. One of my mentors is a leadership guru by the name of uh, John Maxwell, and he talks about the idea, the law of the lid, that there is a limit or a lid on our ability to be effective. And it's our leadership ability. And if we hit that limit, we can't be any more influential than that limit, whatever that limit is. Now, I shared this idea with a friend, and he said, Thomas, this is terrible news because it means that I am ultimately unable to be successful beyond my lid. And I said, no, the good news for you is that you can lift that lid. And that's what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about how you can be aware of the things that are limiting you, and we can talk about how you can raise your lid. John Maxwell goes on to say that leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is influence. And I firmly believe that that's true. Our ability to be successful in the, the uh, span of our work has to do with our ability to influence people around us. So let me ask you a question. Have you, have you ever been in a situation where you had to work for a stupid boss? I mean, I have. And it's frustrating because we think, how in the world did that person get promoted? How did that person get into that position? They obviously don't have any idea what they're doing. Well, what I would suggest to you is that perhaps, perhaps they're operating on a different uh, level of thinking than you're operating. Perhaps they're optimizing for something other than what you're optimizing for. You know, when I got started in my career, I was a hands-on technology guy. I bought my first com uh, computer with money ironed on my newspaper route back when there were newspapers and kids still delivered them. Um, and I, I went to the, the Radio Shack and I bought a computer. And it, it shows you how old I am. But uh, it, was, it was great fun for me to do that. I loved working on technology. It was really cool to be able to take my brain and my two hands and do something really, really powerful. And what I found was that that ability was unusual. It was unusual in the marketplace. I like to say, you know, normals. How do normals handle things, right? Uh, and I was definitely not normal. <laughs> uh, but 
but it really was helpful to me to be able to do things, and people found what I could do to be valuable to them. And so what I learned was that my brain and my two hands really delivered value for me. But ultimately what I discovered is that there were two myths that I had bought into, and these two myths really held me back in my achievement. And we're just going to walk through those two myths. And in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you about your awareness of this. And I've got a, a, a poll here that I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes about these two myths. The first myth has to do with my brain and my two hands, because I firmly believed that geek skills were all that mattered, that my ability to use technical information to apply that in the workplace was the only thing that mattered. And as long as I could do that successfully, I would be successful. And, and it would grow in my career, and I would have the kinds of achievement and compensation and recognition and respect from my peers and from my coworkers, my bosses, because of my, my technical competence. But here's the thing I learned. You know, early in, in my career, first year out of school, the more I learned about geeky stuff, the more I got paid. And that happened in the second year and the third year, too. And so I thought I had this figured out. But eventually I got to the point where my career kind of flatlined and I couldn't figure out why. And the reason is that it's a trap, that that technical competence, that ability to learn and acquire and apply technical information, it does return rewards early in your career, but it doesn't do that for the entirety of your career. And I think that was a major thing, a major thing for me to think through, for me to understand a shift in my thinking had to do with I really believe that. And I'll tell you, that I firmly, firmly believe that there were two factors that led to career success. There was one that had to do with my technical competence. And the other, if you look at a pie chart, the other was this tiny little sliver that I referred to as politics slash BS. <laughs> and, and I really believed that if I only had all the right technical skills, that I would be able to be a, a winner. And fundamentally, I found myself time and time again tripping over this thing that I couldn't fathom that was called politics or other BS that didn't make any sense to me. So what I, what I wrestled with was how can it be? What could it be that there's, is there more to, to success in the workplace than just these two factors? Well, I had a lot to learn <laughs> because what I've discovered is there were actually three areas of knowledge, three domains that are relevant to success. The first is technical skills, and we all would agree that technical skills are, are relevant. The second has to do with business knowledge. Nobody buys technology just for technology. And the final one has to do with influencing skills. What are we going to be able to do to get others to want to work with us? Now, maybe you're like me, and you look at this and you go, okay, there's three areas of competence, and they're all important. And so it must be that it's 33% tech skills and 33% business skills and 33% influence skills. Man, that's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff that I have to, to look at that I haven't been looking at, but okay, I, I get it. Well, in looking at the social science research, uh, it turns out that it's not evenly distributed. It's not evenly balanced. And that was a surprise to me. And how it really works, how it really works is more like this. You gotta have the technical skills. If you don't have the technical skills, you're done. You can't be successful at all. And you have to know business knowledge. And it turns out that you have to know more business knowledge than technical skills. And then look at that green section of the pie chart. That's just crazy, right? Our influencing skills are the most important of the three. That's nutty. How can that be? But it turns out that that's actually the case. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the geeky side, and one of the ways that I'm geeky is I, I read uh, research literature. And I read some research literature about what uh, leaders are looking for when they go to hire a technical project manager. And I would suggest that it's more than just uh, technical project managers. I think this list actually applies to all of us. And by the way, these slides are attached to the presentation and they're downloadable. So uh, feel free to, uh, to grab that uh, as, we, as we wrap up today. Uh, but what I want you to see is on this list from this research study that was done, what IT executives value in IT project managers, uh, leadership, ability to communicate, verbal skills, written skills, attitude, ability to deal with ambiguity and change. And then we talk work history and experience. And I just want to point out that on that list, 
Technical skills made the list, but look at where it showed up, 11th. Technical skills are not even in the top 10. That's the thing that just absolutely, absolutely blew me away. I could not understand how it could be that that's how it, it plays out. But fundamentally, that idea that geek skills were all that mattered turns out to not match reality. My map didn't match the territory. Now, then there's another myth. And this other myth was a tough one, too. This one uh, is quite simply that if I bring my talent and my hard work, that that's going to lead me to success. That hard work was the key to getting me to success in my career. And I genuinely, firmly believe this. I, I worked with a guy named Bill. And uh, back in the day, we were responsible for making sure that the computers in the office worked. And uh, Bill specifically was responsible for making sure that the build of the operating system that went on the machines worked with all the devices that were in the system. And Bill, I'll tell you, he was one of the, the smartest technology guys that I, I mean, he, he had more KB articles open with Microsoft than I think anybody else, because he was a great bug finder. And he would report all kinds of challenges and get fixes made. And he really, really understood the technical aspects of his work. But the problem that Bill ran into is that the organization said, look, we are not a technology company. We're, we're a hospitality company, ultimately. And, and it doesn't take technology to be nice to people. Now, as it happens, I think they're mistaken about that particular perspective, and I've got a lot of anecdotes I could share uh, over the subsequent years that would, I think, demonstrate that. However, this was what the company said. And as a result, they were not willing to give Bill enough people on his team to do the things that he needed to do. And so Bill, who was very highly technical and very committed to success and excellence, Bill uh, tried to make up the gap between the, the lack of staffing that he had and the quality level that he insisted on. Because he said, I'm not putting my name on it unless it's this good. So what did Bill do? He worked longer hours. He uh, didn't take his vacations. He worked over the weekends. Bill was heavily committed to his work environment. And he, he was very committed to delivering quality for the organization. And the organization benefited from his technical application of his skills over the long hours and the, and the intense thinking that he did to be able to be really good at what he did. But when it came time for Bill to get his performance evaluation, what do you think his boss said? Bill's boss said to him, hey, Bill, I appreciate you and the work that you're doing, and uh, you are doing an adequate job, and we're going to give you an average evaluation, and we're going to give you an average compensation increase. And Bill said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I've been killing myself to try to make this work, and you're going to tell me that I'm average? That's insulting. Yeah, it was pretty tough for Bill. It was tough for me, too. I was responsible for software deployment, getting all the uh, endpoints within the environment up to the latest software and having the right version of the software to do the work that needed to be done. And again, the organization wasn't willing to fund at the level that I felt was appropriate, the level that other organizations required in order to get to success. And so uh, what happened was I ended up working evenings and weekends and nights and trying to be able to make that work. We had locations all over the globe, and so I'd start the process, and then I had to uh, stay up all night to watch what it was going and how it was working, and the business was really happy. But again, my bosses said, we don't understand why you're investing so much energy in something that's not that important. And I found that shocking. <laughs> what do you mean not important? This is critically important. I've, I've worked so hard for you. And it wasn't rewarded. In fact, my boss said to me, Tom, why would I promote you? You're doing a great job. I went, what? <laughs> he said, you're doing a great job of the things that you're doing. Why would I change that situation? You see, what I... What I believed was that hard work would make a difference. And what I found out was that it doesn't always make a difference. And I'm trying to figure that out. How can, I, how can that work? Now, here's the thing. Our results that we have in our work have to do with the, the stuff we do, the way we behave at work. And how we behave at work is actually tied to something even beneath that. It's tied to what we believe. Let me, let me give you an example that's very practical. I would assume that most of you who are listening to this webcast are seated presently. And you uh, were successful in placing your backside in the chair in which you're sitting presently. And you behaved your way into that seat because you believed that seat would hold you. You didn't have to do a, a metallurgical analysis of the 
chair before you sat down. You didn't do a, a scientific evaluation of the capacity of the chair to hold you. You just believed that it would. You behaved your way in and look successfully you're seated, right? So this is true for all of us. If we firmly believe something that is not true, we're going to be in trouble. And I firmly believed this idea that hard work works and that my geek skills were all that mattered. But it turns out that's not true. Like this quote from Jim Rohn, he says, if you don't design your own life plan, chances are you're going to fall into someone else's plan. And what do they have planned for you? Not much. That's why it's important for you to be thinking about what is your plan. And today, we're going to be talking about the four levels of thinking. And I'm going to jump right into that right now. Uh, and by the way, that image right there is an infographic that's downloadable from the attachments uh, portion of the webinar. So feel free to, to grab that as well. Uh, what we're going to talk about now is level one. Level one thinkers are individual contributors. And their mantra is, I produce great work. I produce great work. This is about me bringing my brain and my two hands to deliver the work that, that's going. And I, I saw this meme on the internet. And uh, I have to say, it definitely was created by a level one thinker. It says, how long does it take to complete a task? Just you or your team? <laughs> but the idea is that, man, it's just so much easier if I don't have to worry about you. If I could just, you give me the stuff and get out of my way and let me deliver the work. But I want to ask you, if that's the way that you're thinking presently, if you're thinking, look, I'm the one who delivers the value. I'm the one who makes the difference here. If that's what you believe, then uh, you know, is, that, is that working for you? Is that delivering the value that you want to have? Um, I always like to ask, what are you optimizing for? What does success look like? You know, if I believe that my technical acumen is the vehicle that's going to get me to success, then I'm going to optimize for growing that technical acumen. But does your map match the territory that's around you? I'm a dad. I've got seven children. And I love being a dad, and I love my kids. It's great. But there's a huge difference between me uh, heading off someplace by myself and whether I want to take everybody with me. We just did a road trip uh, back over the holidays for a couple thousand miles uh, behind the wheel. And, uh, and I really represented this, uh, this African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You see, if you're optimizing for task completion, for single task completion, then just do it. But if you're optimizing for overall project success, you probably need to incorporate other people. John Maxwell says, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. And that's really what we're talking about. How can you get more done? What can you deliver at a higher level? And who else needs to be involved? So if you're an individual contributor, if that's your level of thinking, how do you know when you're succeeding? How do you know whether what you're doing is working? And then would you follow you? Would you follow you? Do you firmly or earnestly believe that it's your individual contribute, contributions, your brain and your two hands that are the thing that makes the difference? Do you have that idea that, that look, just give me the requirements and get out of my way because I'm going to deliver for you? If that's your level of thinking, I just want to challenge you that perhaps, perhaps your map doesn't match the entire territory. Uh, do you, do you believe that your talent plus your hard work are going to lead you to success? And, and so that's really kind of the, uh, the key thing that I want to, I want to ask you in this, uh, in this first poll, if I can uh, start voting on this poll. Do you believe these myths? Do you believe these myths? And if you do, I want to challenge you to, to consider, is it possible is it possible that maybe there's some other factors that lead to success? You know, I want to challenge you to think about it's, it's not. It's not uh, tech skills plus uh, politics and BS. It's not, uh, you know, it's not about that. Think about why do people buy what you sell? You know, why is it that, that uh, people want what you do? It's, it's not just because you're a technologist. And then... Uh, what do you have to do to increase your influence with other people? I, I think it's, it's fascinating. Um, and, and I think it's a real challenge because if we earnestly believe that we are 
uh, successful, if we earnestly believe that, that our success is dependent upon our technical skills and our hard work and alone, those are the only factors that lead to success. I'm telling you today, you are going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. So uh, as we're, we're, I'm going to keep the, the poll open for another couple minutes now uh, while we keep going. I want to share this idea with you that uh, we do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. We do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. And that's my, my point here. If what you think is wrong, if you need to shift your paradigm. See, nobody ever told me that I needed to shift my paradigm. I thought once I created the paradigm for success at work, that was it. That was all I would need to do. And I was shocked to find that wasn't the case. John Maxwell says, if things always stayed the same, you wouldn't have to grow. But because life changes, you need a plan for ongoing growth. So going back to what Jim Rohn said, uh, you know, what's your plan for growth? What are you doing that's going to make a difference for you as you're going through your journey? I think that's really important to consider. How are you going to grow over the course of your career? So now let's talk for a minute about uh, level two. Level two, you move beyond an individual contributor, but you see yourself as a team member. And your mantra here is, I work with others, and together we produce great work. I work with others, and together we produce great work. And I think this is a powerful shift in, in our thinking, because when we see that, and actually what I'll say is early in the process, fundamentally, I, I'm kind of dependent on you. I'm a member of the team, and what I need you to do is give me the stuff I need to deliver. <laughs> and if you, the only reason I need you is because you help me. And this is a, uh, a slightly modified version of uh, level one thinking. I think you're beginning to stretch your thinking. Uh, I had a friend who said, uh, look, Tom, I only know one song, and it goes, me. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I, definitely, I definitely can identify with that because uh, that was me. There's a photo of me many years ago back when I was running a team, and, uh, and I definitely was task-focused, and I was looking at the team members in terms of what can you do to help me. It was all about what can you do to help me. And I think that was something that really held me back because I, I didn't understand what was involved in that process. And ultimately, it helped me when I shifted to be able to understand what Zig Ziglar said. He said, you can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. You can have anything you want in life if you help and have other people get what they want. And I think this works on a couple of different levels. Let me give you an example. I was, I was working for a large organization. We were just beginning to apply the concepts of project management. And we had this big meeting going on. And uh, we had probably 20 people around a conference room table in one room. We were linked to a, uh, uh, another room uh, that had another bunch of people around the table through video conferencing, and we were talking about what did we need to be able to launch a new application in production. And Jean was the project manager, and, and she basically was trying to figure out what is it going to take for me to get to where I want to go. And she said, okay, I need to have the, the server up and running in production. Who can help me with that? Operations, can you help me? And the operations people said, well, no, we can't help you because we need to know how much power you need and how much rack space do you need and what kind of networking connection. And she said, okay, who knows that? Oh, well, that's the server engineering people. And so the server engineering people, what, what hardware do we need and how, what kind of power, et cetera. And they said, well, we need to talk to the capacity planning people. Okay, capacity planning people, and all these people are sitting around the table. And essentially what Jean was doing is she was identifying what are the dependencies and how do I knock this one down and let this domino hit the next one, hit the next one, all the way around the table. And it really was about her uh, helping those people get what they needed so that they could deliver to the next person what they needed so they could get all of that done. And I think that's a very basic understanding of this idea of you can have anything you want in life if you can help enough other people get what they want. But the next level that you get to is not dependence, but it's interdependence. And it's really moving your thinking. It's saying, how can I help you? Instead of saying, how can you help me, you say, how can I help you? You're moving from me to we. 
how do we shift our perspective? Remember, John Maxwell said one is too small a number to achieve greatness, and I think that's exactly right. Remember, I, I mentioned the, uh, the idea of the social uh, science analysis on this. What does it take to get to success? And multiple studies have shown very similar results to this uh, the Stanford Research uh, study that says your business success is 87% people knowledge, 13% product or technical knowledge. Now, for some of you, you look at that and you're like, that's a load of crap. I'm not buying that. I don't believe that's true. Okay, let's pretend that they're wrong. Let's pretend that they're wrong by 100%. And instead of it being almost 90% people knowledge, let's say it's only 45% people knowledge. Let's say that this study is completely bonkers. Are you investing 45% of your learning and development and growth in the people side of things? Because if you're not, I didn't. I was doing technical stuff over and over and over again when I was in that space. When I was a hands-on technologist, that's what I was doing. But the fact is that people behave differently. And uh, Bob Berg says, all things being equal, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. Berg also says, all things not being equal, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. Fundamentally, your job is to be known, liked, and trusted. If you can do that, the technical stuff works itself out. And I think that's part of a paradigm shift that I want to leave you with today, is being prepared to shift your thinking about that, that a lot of our success has to do with our ability to work with people and that how getting along with people is really relevant. It's been said, all people bring light to a room. All people bring light to a room, some when they arrive, others when they depart. <laughs> so my question for you is, which kind of person are you? Are you the kind of person that brings light when you come or when you depart? People do business with people they know, like, and trust. And if, if you're the kind of person who's always raining on everybody's parade because you're smarter than everybody else, you're not going to be the person people want to do business with. At a, uh, a working in an organization, we had a young woman who was an attractive young woman, a bunch of engineers, happy to go pay attention to her, and she figured out pretty quickly that it was not too difficult for her to get them to pretty much do whatever she wanted. As long as uh, she was nice to them, they would be very nice to her. And so uh, one day we were in an uh, office building that overlooked a courtyard on the fifth floor, and there was a coffee shop over in the building across the, uh, across the, the way. And so this young lady is in her, her cube, and she looks out the window, and she sees Rich. And Rich is walking across the uh, campus over to the other building. And uh, she picks up the phone. She thinks, you know, I'd like to have a cup of coffee from the coffee shop. So she picks up the phone, and she dials his number. And he's walking over, and she looks down, and she sees him grab his phone out of his holster on his belt, look at the caller ID, and he puts his phone right back in the holster. <laughs> She was livid. Now, why was she livid? She was livid because she couldn't believe that he would do that to her. But why? Well, because he knew that she was just calling because she wanted something. She had burned her bridge with him, and he wasn't willing to invest. And you know that's true for you, too, that as it gets to be close to the end of the business day uh, on a Friday, phone rings, you look at the caller ID, you see who it is, and you're like, no, 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 I'm not talking to that person. True for all of us. True for all of us. Now, when we move from level one to level two, what we find is we're able to get stuff done. We're able to be able to deliver technical projects without making people angry. We become more productive. I call people who are in that stage of awareness, I call them producers. And here's what we know. People who are level two thinkers, who are producers, they get promoted. They move up the ladder. They, their elevator's on the way up. And, and that's great. But the challenge is that what happens is we're stepping into a role where we're supposed to be the leader. We're supposed to be in charge of the skills at doing that because we're still a level two thinker. We're thinking like somebody who is a producer. But we really need to shift our thinking again to a team leader kind of thinking. And the mantra of the team leader is, I help others become influential followers who produce great work. That's really what we're talking about. We're shifting our thinking again to say, my job is not to do the work. My job is to help others become influential followers who do great work. My job is not to be the producer. My job is to equip the producers to clear the impediments to their work. That's my job. The problem is that many of us 
get to the place where we get promoted and we go, wait, I'm a manager? How do I get, how do I get to be the manager? What, what am I supposed to do now? I was talking with an organization the other day, and they, they said, oh, yeah, we have leadership training. And I said, you know, often what happens in leadership training is really about how to approve vacation requests. And he said, yes, that's exactly what they taught me. And I said, that stuff's important, but we're talking about how do we really begin to lead people. And fundamentally, what, they, what we find is that 60% of managers fail or underperform in their first two years. 60% of managers fail or underperform in their first two years. Why? Because essentially we take them out to the pond and we shove them off the dock. And we say, I hope you can swim. And the reason we do that is because that's what happened to us. And we don't know any better. I mean, it's really tragic. I was shocked. This Zinger Fultman study says that managers stink. And we've all had difficult managers, right? Uh, but managers stink because the average manager does not get any training until they've been on the job for 10 years. 10 years. That's crazy. That's crazy. But that happens in every organization almost. There are very few organizations that make the investments to try and help you grow. And in fact, I, that happened to me. I, I went to my boss and I said, hey, I want to study some of this leadership stuff. There's this conference I'd like to go to. And my boss said, look, Tom, you're a geek. I will send you to geek certification classes, but I will not pay for you to go to, uh, to leadership training. And remember that Jim Rohn quote about, uh, you know, what plans do you have, right? Are you following somebody else's plan? I wasn't going to fall into his plan. And I'm grateful that my wife was supportive of me uh, investing in myself. And, and so I took vacation time, and I took money out of my wallet to invest in my growth, and it paid. It really paid. It made a huge difference in my career. It's really shifting our thinking at level three from being the, the boss who says go to being the leader who says let's go. Let's work together. It's a shift in thinking. It's a change in the way that we go about the work that we do. Uh, that's this idea of being a better manager. There's a, this paradigm kind of shift. Uh, a friend of mine does leadership coaching in the gaming industry, and one of his attendees said, the paradigm shift from fitting people management in to people management is your job is probably the most important thing I'll take away from this class. And I think that's very, very valuable. How do we begin to recognize that our job is to do more than squeezing in after I get the real work done? It's growing our capability to uh, focus on the people, not the tasks, so, uh, focus on the who, not the do. Because when you do that, team members are going to want to follow your lead. They're going to want to work together. It's powerful stuff, and it's really, really valuable. We're moving beyond our personal performance. Here's, uh, there's a story about a guy who's walking along, and he sees a couple of masons. And he walks up to one mason, and he says, what are you doing? And the mason looks at him frustrated that he's been interrupted from his work, and he says, I'm laying brick. What are you, an idiot? <laughs> and then he goes up undeterred. The guy goes up to the second mason and says, what are you doing? This mason says, I am building a grand cathedral. Let me ask you, which mason do you want to have on your job? I mean, ultimately, even if the first guy's walls are tall and strong and straight, they probably aren't as helpful because of that attitude, because of that thinking. And what am I optimizing for? I'm laying this brick perfectly, or I'm building a grand cathedral. Ultimately, you're no longer the technical expert when you shift into a team leader role. You're not that role. Your job is more like the general contractor who's working to build a building. Now, GC may know about plumbing or electrical or masonry or you know any of these other things, carpentry, but but ultimately, their job is not to do that work. Their job is to make sure that work gets done. It's really thinking about the team. It's, it's we, not me. It's delivering those great results through the team. That's what we're talking about, not about my personal ability. So that's level three thinking. And, and organizations that are able to build team leaders find that they are very successful with that because it's unusual. Most of us are stuck at level one or level two. When you can find somebody who can step into that level three, that's fantastic. But there's another level above that. Because ultimately, you can move to team builder. Now, a team builder's perspective is, my job is not to do the work. My job is not even to, uh, to grow the, the team itself. My job is to develop team leaders who develop others. So my job, my, my ability to influence shifts because I am thinking differently about how I'm going to go about doing this work. I'm going to grow those leaders 
who are then going to grow others. It's, it's, um, it's replication. You know, that's what we're talking about. Uh, John Maxwell says that the, the, the measure of a leader's success is succession. How have you equipped those leaders around you with the skills they need to grow? I was doing some work with an audit company, and this, uh, this founding partner in the audit firm said to me, Tom, what's wrong with my people? And I said, well, I don't know. Let's talk about it a little bit. So we dug in, and we tried to understand what could it be? What could it be about this team? And he said, I don't understand. They will not make a decision. They will not make a decision. I don't understand why these people won't make a decision. And he said, I, I've tried uh, avoiding them. I've tried not answering them. I've tried to tell them what to do. But they, they just they, they, they seem to want, to want my permission. I said, well, let me ask you, are these people any good at their jobs? And he said, they're brilliant. These are the best people in their field. I hired these people because they were really, really good at what they did. I said, well, who had them last? He said, what are you talking about? I said, who was the last person who managed them? And he said, well, they worked for me. And I said, right, I think I can help your people if you'd be willing to work with me. And he said, work with you? I'm not the problem. They're the problem. And I said, well, <laughs> I don't think there's much I can do for you. See, that's the challenge, that, that we, uh, we often think the problem is the other person, but ultimately our job as leaders and influencers is our growth. We have to think about how are we going to stretch our capabilities. Our, our responsibility is to go from being a producer to being a real leader. And then how can I be a reproducer? What can I do to begin to uh, help others around me learn the things I've learned and do the things that I did in order to be successful? I managed a team of, of folks who were um, – who were technology folks who were doing Java implementation, Java development stuff. And uh, we had, had built a great team culture. We built our own city within a city. Uh, we, we established our own team norms for how we were going to behave. And we, we had it, it was, ultimately the organization was fairly sick. We, we were um, quick to throw each other under the bus. We were making excuses. We were low performing. It was culturally overall in the organization not a great situation. And I said to my team, look, we're not going to be that team. That's not who we're going to be, and we'll never throw you under the bus. That doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake that we don't have to correct, but when that happens, I'm going to say this is the decision we made, and here's what we're going to do to adjust. If you do a great job, I'm going to give you credit and say this person did this work. And when we make a decision as a team, we're going to get in the room, and ultimately I have a lot of bad ideas. I know as the boss I have a lot of bad ideas. Your job is to stop me from making stupid decisions. Your job is to tell me when what I'm doing is idiotic. I expect you to tell me that. That's what I need. Now, after we've gone through the process of discussing it, if we ultimately pick a decision that would not be your preference, too bad. That once we've made the decision, when we leave this room, this is our decision. It's not okay for you to come back in six months and say, well, that was a stupid decision. I never would have gone along with that idea. You were wrong from the very beginning. It's not helpful. There's no value in that. And ultimately, you might have been wrong. And it's my job as the leader to make the, the decision, to be able to, to break that log jam that's in there. So we're going to defend each other. We're going to support each other. That was so atypical in my organization that my team loved working for me. I had folks take pay cuts to come join my team because the organization was ridiculous in their compensation strategy. Uh, but they wanted to be a part of doing meaningful work with a supportive environment. It's that powerful. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be a reproducer in that organization. The organization just didn't make the commitment that was needed, and ultimately I had to move on from that organization. And sometimes that's the way it is. But I'd be willing to bet that if you can begin to apply some of these ideas in your workplace fairly quickly, I bet you'll find some significant success from that. What we're talking about is investing in other people. It's really about uh, that commitment that you make to say, I care about you and I want to help you grow. You can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. It's not at all about title or, or role or responsibility. So I want to ask, um, I want to ask a, uh, a question here, another poll for you. And the question is, uh, which 
level of thinker are you today? Which level of thinker are you today? Are you a uh, level one thinker, an individual contributor, where you say my mantra is I produce great work? Are you a team member where you say I work with others and together we deliver great work? Are you a team leader? You say I help others become influential followers who deliver great work. Or are you a team builder? I help develop great team leaders who develop others. See, I think these are the things we want to think about. And you know, going back to that, what can you apply? What can you change? What can you teach? What I want to ask you is, okay, first is self-awareness. Where are you today? And second, what do you need to do to take a step toward that next level? What would it take for you to be able to go to that next level? How can you stretch your thinking? How can you stretch your ability to get you to that place where you're going to be able to deliver at a higher level? I think that's really what we're driving at. Uh, and, and when we begin to understand ourselves better, it equips us to be able to perform in a, in a, in a way that is optimizing for the things that the organization values. I think really what we're talking about is how can we go up in our career? I, I was very frustrated when I went to my boss and said, why won't you promote me? And he just responded with, you're doing a great job. Why would I promote you? I, I, I was astonished by that because my map didn't match the territory. And I think that's really what we're talking about. Uh, so, so now what? What does this mean to you? How are you going to be able to use this information? What can you do to, to make this work? And, and I'd really like to know, if you've got a question for me, go ahead and put it in the questions for audience section. Uh, you know, go ask your questions. The other is, uh, if you have some feedback on, on how this has affected you, or more importantly, what are you going to do? I'd love to get feedback from you uh, on that. I'd love to hear from you about what you're going to do with this information. Now, I want to turn the corner uh, here uh, before we jump into to Q&A. And I want to ask the question. So now we talked about ourselves. Now let me ask you this. Where's your boss? Where's your boss? Because you might be somebody who is thinking clearly about what success looks like, and your boss may be limited. Your boss may have been a producer who got promoted who does not have those leadership skills. And I just want to take a moment to talk about that because we've all been frustrated from time to time about our boss not doing a fantastic job. We've all been in that situation where we felt like, man, why does it have to be this way? Let me encourage you that a rising tide lifts all boats. If you can help your boss look good, if you can help your boss be successful, if you can do some of those things that your boss isn't doing, it's going to help your team. And those things are absolutely noticed. Those things absolutely show. They show in the way things work. Even if your boss doesn't appreciate it, other people in the organization will. And your opportunities will increase as well. Even if you say, I'm in a, a pretty sick culture and my bosses don't get it and I'm not going to get to grow, why bother growing because it's not going to help me? Why bother investing in them and helping them because they don't understand or appreciate it? My point is this is your journey. This is your growth. This is what you are doing. And I think that's really ultimately what we're talking about, is how do we help you uh, on that journey? How do we help you grow? Because even if you're staying in the same organization, your growth is going to help you. And ultimately, you may find, as I did, that you end up having to leave that organization. But your growth is going to go with you. These investments you make in you, they last a long time. So uh, I just want to mention a tool that you can use that can be very helpful in terms of your understanding of how you choose to work and how you choose to communicate. It's called a DISC assessment. Um, and fundamentally what it allows you to do is think about how do I prefer to work and how do I prefer to communicate. And there's more information on the website there about, about that, uh, helpinggeekscommunicate.com slash DISC. Uh, I think there's a lot of value. I found it was really, really useful. I was working with a team member, and she and I clashed a lot. She was an engineer, and... I was trying to lead the engineering team, and she was very frustrated with me because, as I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of dumb ideas. And, and she said, every, every time we come up with these, these projects, you have all these dumb ideas, and you want me to make them work. 
And uh, my response to that is, no, I know I have a lot of dumb ideas. I need you to help make sure that I don't screw these things up. And we did, as a team, we did a DISC assessment. And what we found out was that she is super careful and super precise, as an engineer ought to be. And she's, you know, I thought she was trying to shoot down my ideas. I thought she was trying to, to you know, sink my boat, if you will. And her, her pr perspective was, look, you have a, a boat that has a hull that has lots of holes in it. And if I don't show you the holes in the boat, when you put that boat in the water, it's going to sink. My belief was her intent was negative toward me. Her intent was positive toward me. She thought I was trying to make her crazy by giving her a lot of stupid ideas. That wasn't my intent at all. And when we began to look and understand how we worked, it made a huge impact in our success. Um, so then one of the resources I want to point you to is my podcast, Becoming a Geek Leader, which is available wherever podcasts are found. Um, and you'll be able to uh, catch up. That there's a, a few seasons of episodes that are very practical about as a, as a technology person, what can you do? How can you apply some of these things? Um, and so I encourage you to check out Becoming a Geek Leader. Um, and then here's my uh, contact information. What I'd like you to do is take a moment now as we're wrapping things up. What is your key takeaway? What is something that is really valuable for you? How are you going to apply change or teaching? If you can give me some uh, feedback on that or if you have any questions, feel free to, to put something in the question uh, section of the, of the webinar. My goal here is to equip you, to serve you, and to give you value. I want to help you be successful. Um, as I mentioned, I've got the slides, which you can download. Those are in the attachments and links section. And uh, the, there's, not only are the slides there, but also there's an infographic. It's a one-pager infographic that you can download that will uh, allow you to kind of capture these ideas and be able to communicate some of these ideas as you apply, change, or teach. Uh, so uh, thanks so much for, uh, for being a part of this. I don't see any questions from folks. Uh, but I appreciate your engagement and your investment of time. I'm sure you have other things to run off to, and I'll give you a few minutes now before we have to get back to, uh, the, uh, back, back to your day. Thank you for being a part of this. I want to encourage you to think about what does your growth look like. Thanks so much for being on the webinar, and I would, would love to hear from you about how you're applying what we talked about. Thanks.